Thank you very much for the introduction. And I'm going to talk to you today about protective immunity after SARS-CoV-2 infection. So just by way of background to start with, when we're talking about post-infection immunity, it's worth thinking about what we mean by that. So do we want to think about protection against ever testing positive um, on a PCR test again, um, which might be quite a high bar to meet because actually, even if you're transiently exposed to the virus but don't go on to develop infection, you may well still test PCR positive. Um, or perhaps more helpfully, do we want to think about protection from symptomatic infection? And that might be absolute protection from any symptoms or actually some partial protection that results in reduced chance of severe infection or hospitalization, for example. And then the third piece here is really to think about does post-infection immunity change the chance of onward transmission? And that's clearly got implications for onward uh, control of the pandemic. And then alongside this, thinking about what the underlying mechanisms might be and given those mechanisms, what surrogates are there that we can measure to get some idea of the level of protection. And then the second thing just to make as a background point is that actually there is likely to be widespread post-infection immunity, at least in the short term, because we've now had over 100 million cases of infection described worldwide with only sporadic reports of reinfection. So I'm going to talk to you about what we've learned from a cohort of healthcare workers in Oxford in the United Kingdom. So we have uh, just over 13 and a half thousand staff working in four different hospital sites with um, over a thousand beds between them. And what we did from towards the end of April onwards was to offer staff uh, serological testing every uh, two months uh, and then to offer them PCR testing um, every two weeks uh, so that we could both look for antibodies to the virus and then also actually presence of the virus as well. We also from the end of March offered in-house staff who were symptomatic testing um, with PCR um, so particularly encouraging staff to come forward if they had new cough, fever or loss of uh, their sense of smell or, or taste. Uh, and for the purposes of the presentation, I'll be presenting data up until the end of November last year. So to give you some idea of what the rates of COVID have been like in our staff, this uh, figure here plots the number of cases that we've seen in staff members uh, per week. Um, in the blue line, we've got staff who are symptomatic. Um, so you can see the spike at the start in the first wave where we introduce symptomatic testing and then just under a month later um, when we introduce asymptomatic testing we get an initial spike and then uh, incidence trails off um, over the summer and then we get the second wave coming into the autumn here and you'll see roughly similar numbers there of asymptomatic and symptomatic staff uh, being diagnosed. And broadly, these trends that we're seeing in staff follow what we've seen in the, the wider community with the two waves of the pandemic. The other thing to say is that because we tested staff with antibodies at baseline, we could also uh, pick up a number of staff who were seropositive um, and reported symptoms that occurred before widespread availability of PCR testing. So in the in the yellow color there, um, you've got staff where based on their self-reported symptom onset date, we could actually date their infection to before testing was widely available. So actually the uh, case is starting in staff really from the, the start of March onwards. So in terms of studying reinfection, what we're able to do is take serological tests that were done largely after the first wave and divide people into those who are seronegative and then those who have evidence of previous infection and are seropositive. And in each group, what we could then do, particularly over the second wave as cases in increased, was to look at the instance of new PCR positive results, both in symptomatic and asymptomatic staff, and then also specifically to look at um, the a number of PCR confirmed symptomatic infections as well. The assays that we used for PCR testing included a whole range of commercial and nationally designed assays. And for serology, we used two particular assays. The first um, was a anti-spike IgG assay that we developed in the University of Oxford using a trimeric spike antigen. And um, this had a threshold for calling the number of antibodies detected of 8 million, which I'll, I'll come back to later. We also looked at anti-nuclear capsid antibodies um, using the Abbott uh, commercial platform for this. And both of these platforms in a head-to-head -head evaluation 
had a specificity of uh, over 98%, um, with the uh, IgG uh, anti-spike assay having a, a sensitivity of, of um, over 98% as well, uh, and the anti-nuclear capsid uh, test having a, a sensitivity that was, was just below that, but certainly well over 90%. How we define people as seronegative uh, and seropositive was by, for the seronegative individuals, saying that they could only have uh, negative antibody tests, um, that they were first at uh, risk of infection from the date of their first negative um, antibody test, and then we followed them either to the end of the study um, or to their first PCR positive test. For those who were seropositive, we had a window period which we allowed of 60 days from the date of their first positive antibody result until we started following them up and then we followed them to the end of the study or their next PCR positive test. And we did this irrespective of whether they subsequently sero-reverted. So if we were measuring antibodies over time, it was possible for, for some staff to be positive and then negative, but we considered them to remain in the sero-positive group if that happened. Uh, and we allow the 60-day window period just to exclude any PCR tests that might occur due to uh, RNA persistence from the original infection. And we also only consider PCR positive tests that are more than 60 days after a previous PCR positive test. And, and so looking at that, it will become apparent that it's possible for, for some staff to move between the groups. So you could start off in the seronegative group and then move to the seropositive group if you're infected during follow-up. In terms of the statistical approach we took, so we had the, the two outcomes of any PCR positive result and then PCR confirmed symptomatic infection. We used a standard Poisson regression approach to model differences in incidence between the two groups. And we controlled for age, uh, for self-reported gender, and then also because the incidence changed over time and we had different amounts of follow-up over differing periods of incidence, we adjusted for changes in incidence over time overall. In terms of which of the, the two antibody assays we used for the main analysis, that was the anti-spike assay, and that's because we expected before we started the study this to be most closely correlated with neutralizing activity and therefore protection from infection. But we also then did secondary analyses where we looked at the anti-nuclear capsid antibody or a combination of, of both antibodies. So here are our results from uh, 12,500 healthcare workers, so the majority of our staff participating. Um, and of those, uh, 1,177 had positive anti-spike antibodies at baseline, so just under 10% there. And then a further 88 uh, seroconverted during the course of the study. So this gave us 1,265 anti-spike positive individuals to follow, uh, and then just over 11,000 anti-spike negative individuals. And of those who were seropositive, around two thirds recalled prior COVID-like symptoms since the beginning of February, 2020. And then just over a third had a PCR confirmed infection previously. And many of those who didn't, it's because their symptoms actually predated the time when PCR testing was widely available. To give you some idea of the study population, this, these are adults of working age, so a median age of 38 years with an interquartile range there between uh, 29 and 49 years. Three quarters of those in, uh, involved were female. Similarly, three quarters were of white ethnicity, 15% Asian and 4% black. Um, and then roles fairly typical of a hospital, as you'd expect, nurses and healthcare assistants making up the largest group at 35%, doctors at 15% and then administrative staff just less than that. The rates that people came forward for testing um, were similar in those um, who were symptomatic. So although we told um, staff their antibody results as we went along, we were very clear to say to staff that even if you were known to have positive antibodies or you'd had a previous positive PCR test, we still wanted staff to come back to be tested again if they were um, unwell uh, and broadly we got uh, similar similar rates of attendance for symptomatic testing there. However, knowing your antibodies did affect whether people wanted to come back for asymptomatic testing and we had less people coming back for asymptomatic testing when they knew they were seropositive compared to those who were seronegative. And actually despite offering people testing every two weeks or so, actually in reality people came back 
roughly once every sort of 10 to, to 13 weeks. However, despite the different rates of attendance, when we looked at this sort of inner sensitivity analysis, actually this doesn't substantially change our results. So what were the results? So we had overall an 89% reduction in PCR positive results if people were anti-spike antibody uh, seropositive. Um, and in this group, uh, we had no symptomatic infections. So in the table, so you can see this in some more detail. So in the gray table on the left, um, you can see any PCR positive result with or without symptoms. And you can see that we had 223 individuals, roughly 2% of our seronegative healthcare workers who tested positive, compared to just two of our seropositive healthcare workers. So, so roughly sort of uh, uh, 10, sort of only 10% of the, the number there, and the rates are at the bottom there per, per 10,000 days at risk. And then of those who had symptomatic infection that were PCR positive, we had about 1%, um, just over 1% of our seronegative healthcare workers who tested positive while unwell compared to none of our seropositive healthcare workers. And this uh, plots out the, the data over time. Um, so what you've got to hear on the y-axis is the uh, observed rate of uh, PCR positive uh, results, um, whether symptomatic or asymptomatic, per 10,000 healthcare worker days at risk. Uh, in the red line, you've got those who were seronegative, uh, and then the blue line, those who were seropositive. And so you can see we've got uh, cases uh, in the first wave and then the second wave of the pandemic at the right and left, um, but with a much reduced rate uh, in those who are seropositive. Uh, and when we adjust for age, self-reported gender and overall incidence, this comes up with an adjusted incident rate ratio of 0 0.11, i.e. 89% um, protection. What about the other antibodies we measured? Well, we got very similar results if we looked by baseline antinuclear capsid antibody status or a combination of uh, both antibodies. Um, the, the only difference is, is perhaps where we looked at uh, both antibodies together, those who had um, both detected had more convincing evidence of past infection and, uh, and less evidence of, of reinfection. So uh, overall, we had uh, three individuals who had uh, potential reinfections, and I'll go through these in a bit more detail now for you. Um, two of them had anti-spike antibodies detected at baseline, uh, and then one of them also had anti-nuclear capsid antibodies, and then a third individual had just the anti-nuclear capsid antibodies. So to take you through each one, uh, here's the first. Um, so this individual was seropositive for anti-nuclear capsid antibodies only at baseline. So that's shown as the, uh, the blue dot in the plot above the dashed blue line. Uh, but the purple dot, which represents their anti-spike antibodies, well below the, the purple line, and so uh, negative. At the top of the plot, you can see a green dot representing a, a negative PCR enrolment, um, followed by a positive PCR result around 160 days later. Uh, and the CN value there um, from the Abbott PCR platform, uh, roughly corresponding to, to a CT value in the low 20s. So um, convincing evidence um, that they had uh, COVID at the later time point with a febrile illness at the time. And it may well be that actually the, the prior positive antibody test was a, was a false positive result. The second individual had convincing evidence of infection at baseline. They had appropriate symptoms, uh, were PCR positive, and then they uh, seroconverted with both antibodies becoming positive, which you can see there at around day 50. Um, with both the, uh, the blue dot above the dashed blue line and the purple dot above the dashed purple line. Um, and then we then followed them over time and then roughly uh, half a year later uh, they developed a further PCR positive test while they were completely asymptomatic. But then when we repeated PCR tests two and four days later these were actually negative. So this could have been a false positive in our, in our laboratory or it may represent transient uh, PCR positivity without necessarily infection developing. And then in the third case, although they reported a, uh, a febrile illness in mid-February, uh, they were seropositive only for anti-spike antibodies when tested in May, um, and then became PCR positive while asymptomatic um, again around half a year later, which was confirmed on, on repeat testing. Um, so again here, questions about whether the initial antibody uh, result uh, 
uh, in May that was positive for anti-spike was was uh, an appropriate uh, result or, or, or not. What you can see on this slide is that we were also able to look not just at whether people were antibody positive or negative, but actually to use the uh, antibody reading that we got as well in a quantitative way. So in the left hand panel there, we've got the anti spike uh, reading uh, in millions of units. So 8 million there is the dashed line, which represents a positive result. But what we're plotting here is the uh, model that uh, estimated daily instance of PCR positive results. And so you can see the blue line actually coming down and showing protection from um, about 4 million units onwards. And similarly, if we look at the anti-nuclear capsid antibody, again, you can see if uh, 1.4 here is the threshold for a positive result, actually below 1.4, you can see that the, the, the risk of uh, a, a positive PCR result actually going, going down at lower levels than that. So it may well be the case that there's protection from infection, uh, what might be reported as negative results, but actually where the, the numeric values are, are near the threshold. Uh, there may be less infection. So what about uh, limitations uh, to this work? Well, the first thing is that, as I touched upon, that there was voluntary follow-up. And so uh, actually individuals only came back around every 10 to 13 weeks. And so undoubtedly we will have missed some potential PCR positive results in those who were asymptomatic. Um, and we also had reduced asymptomatic screening in those who were seropositive. But when we did a sensitivity analysis to account for this, we didn't see a big change in our results. We just looked at adults of working age. They were predominantly white and predominantly female, uh, so we may be less well able to comment on what protection is like in other groups. And similarly, we also just looked at healthcare workers, and there may be a question about how representative they are of the general population, particularly if the, the nature of their initial exposure may have been in a higher than other people experienced. And then we only follow people for around six months and so further studies are needed to understand how long people might be protected for. But actually this may be quite difficult to do in practice as, as quite a few of our, uh, even our seropositive healthcare workers have now been vaccinated and so it may be difficult to now tease apart what, how much of the ongoing protection is from vaccination versus previous infection. Just to, uh, as I finish, to highlight a couple of other studies which have done uh, similar work, uh, so the, the SIREN studies, a UK-wide uh, study of healthcare workers, uh, where healthcare workers were followed from June to November, uh, and here having actually regular fortnightly PCR and antibody testing. And in contrast to our study, where we just defined prior infection on the basis of antibody, here both PCR testing or antibodies could be used to identify prior infection. And so there were just over six and a half thousand healthcare workers who had evidence of prior infection and then 14,000 who had no evidence of prior infection. And then in those two groups who saw fewer reinfections, just 44 in those with prior infection compared to uh, 318 with PCR positive results. And you can see the number who were, were symptomatic on the slide. So in the study, what the authors do is to calculate an odds ratio uh, for symptomatic reinfection of uh, 0 0.08, so this is uh, consistent with 92% protection, uh, and then protection against any PCR positive result of uh, 0 0.17, so 83% protection. Uh, and then finally, data here from Newcastle in the UK, where uh, similar cohort of healthcare workers with uh, 11,000 or so who had uh, previous antibody testing um, and were followed up um, and they could be defined as having had infection either on the basis of PCR or antibody tests uh, and of those who were previously infected uh, a thousand of them none went on to get a, a further symptomatic PCR confirmed infection in the second wave of the pandemic compared to just under three percent of those who had no evidence of previous infection. So to conclude in our cohort, uh, anti-spike and anti-nuclear capsid antibodies uh, were both associated with protection from reinfection for most people uh, for up to at least six months. No uh, anti-spike uh, antibody positive individual developed a symptomatic infection. And we also saw this evidence of a quantitative relationship between antibody readings, uh, where those who had readings below thresholds for detection, uh, just below the thresholds, uh, still were relatively protected from PCR-positive results.
So thank you very much for your attention. I'd like to thank all those who helped run the study, many of whom are listed there, and you can uh, read more about it in our paper. Uh, and then finally, to thank all of our staff who participated. Thank you.